I've got this model, and I'm looking at it, and it's kind of, hmm, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me because it looks like a spider web. But maybe what I want to do is I want to very quickly go in and say, well, you know what? There's some things on here that I don't really care about, right? So again, there might be candidate software. Candidate software doesn't necessarily have to just be the software that we don't recognize. It might be software that's running on a server that really has no impact on that particular business service, something like a backup agent or, or what have you. So again, we have the ability to go in and show hide. We can hide candidate software. We can hide different things that might be you know, not part of the system. Once we hide those, again, it redraws the map for us. And again, if I zoom out a little bit, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here and I'm going to change my layout from this force directed to my impact layout. I want to see what this is going to look like in my database or in my CMDB. So again, if I, if I come in here and I zoom in, what we see is we see those F5 load balancers supporting a pool of virtual IP addresses. Um, oops, let me go back to scroll mode. Um, scroll, thank you. Um, and again, the sites that are, that are front-ended by those web, uh, web servers, we can see the SharePoint servers connected. Again, the dependency information is captured, observed communications. We can see dependency information as in it runs on a specific server, um, and different types of, of information are available to us. So again, we can see the containment of the database, the server that it's running on, all the way down to the servers themselves. And if I had a stack, um, or if I had down here somewhere a, um, um, a, a switch that was part of my, my model, I would be able to see that as well. And again, what we're seeing here is the fact that I've got a, a, a cluster, a, a Microsoft cluster that's running a particular piece of software, and that software is supporting 87 different database instances, but the database instance that we're concerned with here is the education portal, and these are the other things that go into delivering that particular business service to, to my end users. I'm sorry, I'm scrolling over here. So again, the pools of IP addresses that are supported by those load balancers, the web server front end, all of that's automatically captured. And we've, we, we've recognized this software because it's part of that library of software that we provide on a monthly basis. We provide updates to, those, uh, to that software and give you this ability. Now, this is a software-centric view. Suppose I wanted to look at an infrastructure-centric view of the same application. What I can do is I can go in here and I can change my focus from software to the actual infrastructure itself. What it's going to do is it's now going to pull back the infrastructure associated with that information. Now, you can see that's pretty ugly, right? So let's go back to our, our, our force directed, and we'll see what's out there that maybe we don't necessarily need to see as part of this view. So again, I can show and hide things like the file systems, right? Do I really need to, to understand all of the various file systems on those servers? Maybe, maybe not, depending on what my focus area is. Um, network devices, I, I can see those. Do I want to see the software instances or the subnet information? Maybe I don't care about the subnet information. And again, what we're doing is, is we're creating a view that we can now look at from a different perspective, an infrastructure perspective. So I can see the servers that are running. And again, here's those potential pieces that have that name from, from my initial starting point, but they don't, they don't come into play as far as my infrastructure view goes. And again, now if I take this information, actually let's, let's go ahead and get rid of these off the screen. So I'm going to just select them again, and I'm going to say go away. Um, and, and by doing that, now if I change my layout again to that impact layout, I've got a view of what the impact is from the switch all the way up to the, the software instances running on a specific server, so on and so forth. So those are the, the, those are the types of things that we're delivering automatically through this interface, through this product. And again, once I've decided that it's something that I'm, I'm happy with, it's the right model, I've, shared the, the, I've exported this picture and I've shared it with the, the subject matter expert or the business owner and said, hey, is this, what, is this right? Um, they can say yes or no, and if you need to make changes, again, you can select any one individual item. You can right-click and say, I want to remove this node. 
Now, the next time we run a discovery, we might see that node connected again. But as soon as we remove the node and we, re we save it as removed, it will not automatically add itself back in to this model. So again, it, we've, we've tried to simplify this and make it as easy as possible. And again, once I'm happy with something, I can create an application model. I can give it a name. Uh, we call it, uh, I can't type, so I'm going to make it short. Um, and now I've got the beginnings of a portal or of a, a, a service model, right? And notice, though, it's not published at this point. Right, so I can I can now choose to go back and publish it. Now uh, all of a sudden I got this stuff back in here again. So maybe what I want to do is is again go back into my selection, get rid of it, take it off the screen. Oh, that was dumb. Uh, sorry. And then let's remove those items. And now what I want to do is resave it. Right. So I'm going to save the changes now. When I bring up this view. It will remember this the way it's laid out right now. So that was the, the new dynamic modeling available within the BMC Discovery. And again, we go through the, the several stages of being able to model, to publish. As soon as we publish, it's made available and synced to the, to the configuration management database. If we need to go back and revise it, we can always go back in, edit it, revise it, republish it. And again, those changes will be reflected immediately um, in the CMDB itself. So what is, let's talk about some of the other enhancements that have come as part of the new version 11. So we t currently recognize and interrogate accurately over 3,500 different data center components, whether that's operating systems or whether that's routers and switches and printers and, and um, you know, your, your mainframes, your load balancers and so on. That number is, is exceptional. You won't, find, you won't find that level of commitment from any other discovery vendor in the, in the industry. Now, we've made some enhancements to some of the capabilities that we had, uh, and we've also added some new capabilities. New capabilities, especially the EMC VPlex. VPlex discovery is a very different animal from vSphere, uh, vCenter, and, and things of that nature. However, we've also enhanced some of the, the, the vCenter capabilities and so on. Um, so let's talk about some of the, the changes that were made. In the version 10 and prior, or 10X and prior releases of, of ADDM, while it was very good at finding clusters, while it was very good at understanding how a cluster would be represented, it did not properly represent the clustered software that was running on that cluster. If we, if we discovered a device in a cluster that was running as the primary, and it was running a particular piece of software, we would only see that running software on that one server in the cluster, and we would associate it to the server. What we're doing now is we've changed that concept to say, oh, well, we recognize this as a cluster, and we also recognize, based on our library of known applications that this is a clusterable application, I'm going to associate this software with a cluster rather than a specific machine. Because in the case of a failover and that second machine comes up and I see that software running on the second machine and not the first machine when I do the discovery, I'm going to change the, uh, things in the model. And again, it's not properly reflected. So we fixed that, right? So now we have a new designation um, with the software to, to actually be running on the cluster, not on the host itself. So we started out with some of the most prevalent software that we recognize in the industry, and we, we understand both OS-level clustering as well as software-level clustering. I'll give you an example of that. Um, so Microsoft has built-in clustering capabilities, and Oracle um, and the uh, you know, ESX servers the clustering happens at the OS level. But a product like BMC Discovery is a software cluster. Well, so these, app, these discovery appliances run completely standalone, but the software, the, the discovery application itself understands how to communicate with these other um, 
uh, discovery appliances and have them act as a single. So that's a software type cluster and so on. So what we've done is we've gone through and we've, we've captured, um, we've always been able to, to, to discern the, the kind of a cluster, but now what we're doing is we're updating all of the, the application libraries to reflect whether software can be run as part of a, uh, a cluster or if it's only designated as standalone software i.e. backup software and things of that nature. So we update these on a monthly basis, and as we update them on, on a monthly basis, you'll be able to, to, to pull that information in and more accurately um, view what's in those clusters. And again, understanding the mapping of how that would be viewed in the cluster. Couple of upgrade considerations. We're going to make some changes right away. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to remove the software that, that we've associated with the host we're going to create a cluster, and we're going to associate the cluster uh, with the, the, the running software. So that's a, a significant impact that could take place in your environment. However, it should more accurately reflect the way that software actually runs in your environment. So vCenter Discovery, we kind of did did things a little differently before, and, and we've found that we can now discover as much information as we need about a vCenter environment by directly communicating with the vCenter, as opposed to having to go out and individually scan all of the, the current running guests and then associate those back to the vCenter and understand the vCenter configuration with its clustering and so on, and be able to go out and ask the vCenter, okay, what are you managing? Right? Give me a list of what you're managing. Now, tell me about those devices and give me the details about those, those guests that are running on your environment. Also, in previous releases, it did not matter how many vCenter uh, uh, vCenters were defined within your environment, uh, vCenter consoles and so on. Each one had to have its own set of credentials. Even if it was the same credential running on multiple different machines, we have fixed that. So now you only need one vCenter credential for each individual instance of a credential in your vCenter environment. As I said, one of the new capabilities is now vPlex discovery. And vPlex allows us to capture um, the, the EMC storage running under a vPlex um, um, controller. And the way that that was designed to work is through a RESTful API. In previous releases of ADDM, we did not have that RESTful API, so it was, it was not possible for us to capture the storage information behind a VPlex, um, a, a VPlex, VPlex controller. So now we're using a combination of SSH to get some of the basic Linux information, and we're using the RESTful APIs to get the configuration of the VPlex console itself and understand now a very clear picture of everything behind there. So again, additional storage that we've added. So again, we might be the only company in the industry that can relate storage to the business service model that's associated with those, those models that we create um, uh, and synchronize into the CMDB. Why is that important? Well, if you don't have the full picture of what SAN devices are supporting what database servers so that you know what, um, what potential impact a, a SAN outage could have, Mm, you, you might be up a creek. Anyway, so we, we continuously add new SAN devices as part of those monthly updates. We continuously enhance our capabilities to understand um, the, the, what, we're, what we're discovering there, and we've added automatic um, uh, mapping of, of NetApp LUNs in this uh, environment. So again, we're, we're, we're continuously updating the, the application. Previously, we relied on, on queries, on standard queries run against an inventory process to pull back inventory information. But if you've ever queried a VMware server to capture the, the, uh, a guest operating system on a VMware environment, you might see something that's not entirely accurate when it comes back with the processor information. So what we've done is we've changed the concept of how we capture CPU information so we can more accurately count threads, we can more accur accurately count cores, we can more accurately provide the actual type of processor, whether it's physical or not physical, um, 
as part of that. So we're now doing that through a pattern, much the same way as we would interrogate software or something of that nature.